Okay. Shall we, shall we start, or are we waiting for the other session to... Uh, I think it's fine. It's fine. Yeah? Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for, for attending the session. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers of, of SciTech. Uh, I was a member of the ASO 10 years ago. It makes me feel old saying that. And I was the lead organizer for SciTech in its old uh, format in 2007. And it's very heartwarming to see this event uh, grow and evolve and continue to, uh, to take place. Uh, I'm actually, I just realized, uh, you know, I wear many different hats in my work in Jordan, and I just realized that what I'm going to talk about now is not even listed in my, uh, like, affiliation on the program. So I work in, in consulting uh, in Amman in a company called Engicon. Uh, also started a podcasting platform uh, in Arabic called Saut. But uh, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the work that I've done on, on the advocacy side uh, to promote uh, uh, the use of public transport uh, in Amman. Uh, in Jordan today, uh, one in every 20 trips, or in Amman specifically, one in every 20 trips is taken on public, on, on buses, uh, on large buses. It's a very low, a very low percentage. And, uh, you know, these, these trips are usually taken because people have no other, uh, no other option. Uh, car ownership is increasing at about 7% per year. Just to give you some perspective, the rate of growth in car ownership in some Western European countries is below 1% a year. So we're talking about a very rapid increase in the number of private cars uh, in the country. Uh, more than 40% of the population is under the age of 18, and only 13% of women, of working age women, uh, have a job. So it's one of the lowest employment rates, actually, for women in the world, lower even than Saudi Arabia and, and, and other countries in the region. Uh, these two points uh, just go to show how much there's going to be an explosion in, in, in transport demand in the future, not only due to natural population growth, but also due to, uh, you know, more people uh, entering the workplace and demanding transport and mobility uh, uh, in the future as, as they enter the workplace. So population in Jordan today is about just over 10 million. Uh, we had a census in 2015, and the current estimates put it at about 10, uh, 10 million. Uh, it's a young population. Uh, it's a growing, uh, uh, growing population. Uh, the, uh, uh, the cost of living is, is on the rise. Amman is today considered the seventh most expensive uh, Arab city, and even more, you know, higher in, in ranking. According to other rankings, it's even the most or the second most expensive Arab city in terms of uh, cost of living. Costs are increasing with government subsidies now being lifted on uh, fuel and bread and other and other commodities. Uh, Mobility uh, is very much car-oriented. Uh, investments over the past several decades have, have focused on improving road infrastructure, uh, building tunnels and bridges and intersections, and making it easier for private cars to move around, and not so much uh, on public transport. I mentioned the number of, of cars, the growing number of, of cars. The quality, on, on, you know, on, on one side we invested on, in road infrastructure, on the other side, Public transport in infrastructure has remained uh, stagnant. The number of buses hasn't really changed or increased in the past 20 years, even though the population has, has more than doubled. Uh, we have a fragmented system that relies mostly on individual, uh, individual owner-operator. Uh, owner uh, there is no government subsidy, so the fares that the users pay uh, is, is expected to cover the cost, and that creates an environment where there is no uh, reliable schedule or reliable service where buses wait to get to be full and then and then start moving. So really, public transport uh, is very limited, and it's it's used by captive users who have no other choice, who use the bus only because it's uh, you know it's it's uh, the only option available, not because it's easier or more convenient uh, than using a car. Uh, and of course, there's, you know, for those of you who have come to Amman, visited Amman, I think Amman is many things, but it is not a pedestrian-friendly city. So we have very poor infrastructure for, uh, for pedestrians and, and other modes uh, of transport. Uh, the traffic congestion in Amman, in Jordan, is expected, is cost, cost the economy around $1.5 billion a year. We are, we haven't reached the scales of, of you know, mega cities in the region like Cairo, but we're getting there. Uh, Amman today has a population of, of uh, over 4 million, but as I said, it's increasing rapidly. The number of cars is increasing rapidly. 47% of energy costs in the country are attributed to transportation, to, uh, you know, in, in all of its, uh, in all of its modes, and that's, that's a very high percentage even, uh, you know, compared to international standards. 
25% of household expenditures uh, go to transportation. And as I mentioned, there's a lack of safe uh, and affordable access to transportation uh, for women. So this is just to give you an idea of, of uh, how chaotic the system is. Yellow taxis, which are considered technically public transport, do function as public transport in Amman because of the gap uh, that is left by uh, you know, the, the, the system being so lacking. Uh, government has been very slow in implementing solutions, unfortunately. Uh, and the focus has always been on building infrastructure. We, you know, we like to build our way out of things. In, in the past, in the 90s and 80s, we've built our way out of traffic congestions by building more uh, roads and, and, and uh, underpasses and bridges. And of course, over time, the number of cars increased and these bridges and intersections were congested again. So as they say, if you build it, they will come. Uh, the, uh, so there's focus on building infrastructure. There's a lack of capacity and understanding at, at, the, at the different institutions or political uh, organizations in developing more innovative solutions, technology-based solutions that are less costly, that can be more effective uh, in the long run. And even the solutions that, are, that involve building new infrastructure uh, are very slow-paced. We were just talking about the Amman Bus Rapid Transit uh, project. Uh, this project was supposed to begin operating in uh, was supposed to begin operating in 2012, but uh, hasn't uh, op began operation yet. And it's scheduled to start operating in 2021 or 2022, uh, nine years behind schedule or 10 years behind schedule. So this is where uh, Ma'an Nasr comes in. Ma'an Nasr is, is Arabic for together we will arrive or we will get there. It's, it's a citizen-based uh, advocacy group founded in 2014 by a progressive platform called Taqaddam that came out uh, during the, uh, the Arab Spring and a climate change uh, advocacy group called Tahawul. Uh, Ma'an Nasr's is aim is to, is to make uh, public transport a national priority in Jordan. Uh, we do this through uh, building awareness, through advocacy and lobbying, uh, through research, and also through developing solutions on our own. This is a completely volunteer-driven effort, so the solutions we build are at a small scale, in the hopes that they would be uh, you know, adopted uh, and, and expanded by, by uh, the different authorities that are managing, uh, you know, running the, the transport system. Uh, in, in our beginning, we, we marched to the city, to City Hall, and handed the mayor a petition uh, you know, calling for improving, uh, improving public transport in the city. These are some of the, some of the content that we create uh, online and also post offline. Just spreading awareness about the problems, uh, you know, some of the statistics that I mentioned already, uh, on, on transportation uh, and, and mobility uh, in Jordan. We've, uh, uh, we've, we're always at, at bus terminals and stations meeting with people, telling them about our campaign uh, and getting recruiting volunteers uh, to help us out. We've met with university students, engaged with many universities who also face issues with, with transportation to their campuses. Uh, we've lobbied with, with Parliament. Uh, the Jordanian Parliament passed a very important uh, piece of legislation governing uh, passenger transport last year, and we had a big role to play. We attended the committee meetings and uh, got certain paragraphs added related to institutionalizing the government subsidies uh, uh, on public transport. Uh, the most exciting maybe uh, uh, work that we've done is developing solutions. So as I mentioned, we try to also work on, on solutions on the ground, in addition to the advocacy and the awareness, uh, in hopes that they would be, that would be scaled up. One of the, the, the major problems in, in public transport in Amman is the lack of information, basic information. If you get to Amman, you want to use a, a bus route, you have no way to find out, or you had no way to find out which bus, which bus to take. Even for people who regularly use the bus every day, uh, know the routes that they take. If they want to make an, a, an irregular trip that's outside of their schedule, they uh, take a taxi. So, because it's very hard to figure things out, uh, except for you know asking people or word of mouth. And <clears throat> for some reason, there's a pervasive culture of, of uh, you know not giving out data or not providing data from the government side. Uh, the government, it's it's. You know, Amman is still a manageable city. It's not a huge city with a huge informal public transport sector like in Cairo, for example. The routes are regulated. They're uh, licensed by government. The government has the data, but unfortunately, uh, they don't provide the data to the public. So there's a lot of data, and that's a problem we have in Jordan. We have, you know, sometimes we say, we joke that we're the most studied country in the world. We have so many studies and data collected and strategies, but it's not being used uh, to its fullest potential. So in, in 2015, we embarked on, uh, on a project to, to map out 
the public transport network in Amman. We were inspired by many cities uh, around the world, uh, including Nairobi, where, where there's an MIT-supported uh, project called Digital Matatus, which uh, is, was also a citizen-led uh, mapping effort to map, uh, to, map bus, uh, to map the bus network there. Uh, and this was uh, basically led by a team from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning here at MIT. Uh, we also worked actually with, with the regional uh, uh, groups in Beirut and in Cairo that are doing similar work in mapping and have had a jo joint workshops where we exchanged our experiences in, in the work that we're doing. So this was literally a manual effort where we had volunteers ride on the bus, use a tracking uh, app on their smartphones, and you know, ride the routes from start to finish. We did this on around 100 routes. Uh, the budget was around $22 just to buy them some sandwiches and to cover the ticket costs. And we managed to map uh, uh, over 100 uh, routes, uh, buses, you know, large buses, and then coasters, which are the mini buses. We call them coasters in Amman because they're Toyota coasters. And the services, which are the small uh, white shared ride, uh, shared uh, fixed route taxis. And this was really an effort where so many different people were involved. We had volunteers riding the routes, and then we got uh, designers, uh, a local design company called Syntax, volunteered to do this work pro bono to turn our data into a nice looking, colorful, schematic uh, map. So we, beg we began you know, mapping the different landmarks, mapping the routes. Uh, that, uh, that we were getting. And this was really a, a challenge because we're not in Amman. I would say in the Arab world in general, maybe because of the, the types of governments that we have or for different reasons, we're not used to uh, looking at maps. Uh, you know, we're, not, we're, not, we're never provided information at that, at that uh, scale. So it was a challenge for us to map Amman, especially developing a schematic map where we were trying to make it easy to use. There's no, for example, there's no river in Amman where you could easily tell areas apart. Amman is a hilly city, so the hills are one of the, for example, important features of the, uh, of the city. So it was a challenge uh, representing the different, the different neighborhoods, the, the different routes, but we ended up, uh, we ended up with, uh, with a map that we, we released in, uh, in, 2000, in early 2016. So we called the map Khututna, which means our routes, sort of taking ownership of the, the transport system. Uh, this, uh, looks, you know, I've showed this to people and they said, when is this going to be implemented? It looks like a futuristic uh, network, but it's actually the exist, it's much more messy when you go on the ground. It's, uh, this is the existing network of buses and coasters and services in Amman. Uh, we try to, to do it in a, you know, user-friendly format that's easy to read, in spite of all the challenges in the system itself. There's no numbering on, on many, most of the buses, so we had to create our own numbering. So we have a set instructions on the back of the map on how to read it. Uh, so we had to create uh, numbers so you can track the route from one end to the other. Colors were just uh, added to make it look nicer and maybe to indicate what direction uh, the routes uh, travel. Um, stops are not enforced in Amman bus stops. So as you can see, there's no stops along the routes except for the, uh, the main terminals because you can really just hail a bus uh, on the street and... Uh, and get, get on, and if you're on the bus, you hit the window with a coin and they can drop you. So we, we didn't stop here. Uh, uh, we took the map to the next level. The following year, we, we got in a, a developer, a local developer, and turned this into an app uh, called Khututna, available also today on, on iOS and Android. Uh, the, the app has a trip planning feature where you can enter a start and end point and you get the shortest path that you can take on, on public transport uh, to get to your destination. Again, we had to do this in spite of all the challenges in the system. There's no scheduling. You know, it, we could have easily provided our data to, to, to many of the open source platforms out there uh, that do transit mapping, but we had to deal with the, the system that we have. There's no schedule, so it doesn't give you any times. There are no enforced stops, so the, you know, going from home to work, the app is going to tell you to walk to a certain point. We had to create virtual fake stops every 200 meters, just to give you an idea of the, uh, the kinds of things you had to do to deal with the, uh, with the problems in the existing system. So this was launched in, um, in mid-2017. Uh, and to take this effort forward, we, uh, uh, we, we made the data and the API that we, we created as part of the app available to developers. And in late 2017, in the fall, we, 
we held the first public transport hackathon in, in Amman, where we had uh, around 60 people participate, uh, different teams from professional developers to eighth grade uh, school students who used our data or just developed their own solutions uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, built, built on our app uh, and to improve it. So we had people doing chatbots where you can just tell the chatbot where you want to go and it will give you the bus routes. We had people adding features to our app, to the app itself to help more volunteers track routes and add them to the database. Uh, so this, this was in the, in the fall of, of 2017. Uh, and we're continuing our work. We've worked with one of the, we're working with some of the hackathon winners now to improve, to, to update our app and improve on it. Uh, and now we have the local authorities you know, uh, involved. They want to get involved after seeing the solution uh, on the ground and how, you know, uh, how effective it is. We're working with the municipality, with the winners from the hackathon to develop a model bus route where we could use the app and also introduce other technology-based solutions to improve service on that route as, as a showcase or as a model uh, for other routes in the city and in the country as a whole. Uh, we, so we've also got, you know, been in touch with the, the national regulatory agency. They want to do something similar in other cities, expand the map uh, to other cities. And this was really the point, developing solutions at, at you know, a small scale, even though Amman is not very small, but for the sake of expanding it uh, and growing it to, to other cities. Uh, and really, you know, in the back of our heads, you know, part of an, an ongoing uh, objective in all of this is to, to showcase and to, to show the effectiveness of having uh, open data to, 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 you know, the government. We struggled with the municipality to get the, the root data that they have. We ended up getting it at the end after manually collecting the data. So there's really trying to break through this, this culture of uh, not sharing any data. I think this, is, this was the point of a hackathon. And, uh, and you know, continuing our work with the, with the winners of the hackathon. We're also participating in a, pro a TV program called Mish Mustahil, which is not impossible. That's modeled after Shark Tank in the US where uh, people, so there's one episode on public transport where we participated in selecting the, the, the contestants and they presented solutions. And actually one of the winners here is going to, to work with us on the, on the, model, on the model bus route. Uh, and of course, we're going to continue our work in, in awareness building and lobbying and advocacy, uh, the work that I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, th you Hazem. Uh, we'll have time to accept questions from the audience. Uh, I'm going to give you this, the microphone. I can give them the microphone, and you can take oh, this to answer. Uh, so sure. it'll be easier for you. Sorry. Um, yeah, so thank you. That was super interesting. Um, I think this is very important because I'm from Lebanon, so that is definitely something necessary back, back home. Um, I have two quick questions. The first one being, you mentioned uh, the difficulty women had um, accessing public transportation or you know, just how they deal with it. Other than mapping it, how have you guys made it more comfortable for women to be able to use that uh, that system, and what's the general feedback you've received? Is it, you know, do do the people think it's super helpful, or is it just the government that wants to look good and take it on to other cities just to claim that they've done some work? <laughs> uh, so, in, in some of the research that we've done, we've uh, we've found out that. Uh, some of the problems that women face might be either, you know, exaggerated. It's not as uh, as big of a problem, and or also they might be linked to, to social norms rather than things in the system uh, itself in the public transport system. But that said, uh, we haven't directly done work yet to improve conditions for women on the ground. But uh, we're we're working with another organization, an NGO in, in Jordan, that's doing that. And the model bus route that I mentioned will include some elements that are uh, that take into account uh, women users. Uh, you know, like, you know, there's, there's basic things like improving uh, security and lighting at the bus stops, at the stations, uh, things on the bus that, that would cater for women. But at the end of the day, many of the things that we talk about are really improving the service for everyone, not just for women. So we haven't directly done work on that, but, uh, but it's, it's something that we're going to do with the, uh, 
with the model bus route. Lack of information, I think, was, was one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the problems that we face. And we've talked to many women who have actually found the map very useful. Uh, All right. Uh, thank you. This is really interesting. I lived uh, in Amman for three years, and I'm trying to rack my brains. Where is it? I've seen a bus. I don't think I have. I've only seen, uh, you know, school buses all over the place. Yeah. But my question is related to the scheduling. I mean, how difficult is it to instill uh, fixed bus uh, stations and routes and, and organize the, the routes just like anywhere else mm -hmm. in the world? Why is it? Why does it have to be that you do as you mentioned, which is right, I mean, you just knock on and go, but if yeah. there are laws to make it more rigid, people would adapt to it, wouldn't they? Uh, the problem is with the, the current arrangement, the contractual structure between, between operators and, and the government. Um, basically now the government sets uh, the fare, uh, identifies the route, and basically just tells the operator to run their bus. So the operator's only incentive is to increase the number of people on the bus and increase their revenue. That's, that's their only incentive. And, and what we're trying to push for is where they get a subsidy, where the government you know, pays the operator based on uh, their adherence to schedules, where they pay the operator per kilometer, for example, and then the government takes the risk of running an empty bus rather than the operator doing that. So it's the, the, the structure of the relationship and the, the incentive structure that, that makes it difficult to, uh, to enforce. And, not, not enforcing stops is another challenge. I, I think that's, I don't know why they do that. Uh, I guess, that, you know, police enforcement maybe is not as strong uh, uh, when it comes to traffic police. So maybe. Are there fixed stations? There are some fixed bus shelters and stops, yeah. yeah. And many, some new ones have been installed, but it's still, uh, they're still not, uh, you know, sometimes you find a bus shelter on one side and the bus stops on the other side and drops off passengers. But on, on running schedules, that requires a subsidy. Uh, and changing the whole the whole model of operation, and that's what the government is thinking of doing for the BRT at least. Thanks, Hazim, for your presentation. Luckily, that I'm Jordanian and I'm here for one week, so I have the chance to see this good presentation. Actually, I have many questions, but I don't want to take long time. The first question is: Your role here to do, to highlight the, that we have an issue and to work for a solution or you are just uh, having a simulation for the routes, for the roads, for the conditions that we have in Jordan. Because in order to reach for a solution, we must have a vision, a clear vision, reaching a target to have a, a general transportation system in Jordan. So what you are doing here is fine, that you are preparing routes, uh, preparing maps, what is the shortest location. But is this your target, to find these routes and to highlight the locations, or you are planning to develop your system to be a complete, comprehensive transportation system? This is my first question. Okay. So you want to ask yeah, the uh, Answer me, so I can ask you the second <laughs> one. <laughs> and we're, we're, uh, we're a volunteer-run campaign. We, each, we all have our, you know, our jobs. So this, this was, uh, and the solution that I mentioned is only one track in the work that we're doing. So we also work on advocacy, as I mentioned, on building awareness. We've worked with parliament. So we, we have an overall objective of, of improving public transport, making it a national priority. We do this through different, uh, different ways, uh, advocacy and lobbying, awareness, and also building, building through. This is only one, uh, one track. And, uh, so it's, and it's not our job, really, to develop a plan for improving transportation in Jordan. It is, it's the government jobs. And there are plans in place for uh, public transport for Jordan and for Amman that are not being you know, followed to the, to the extent that's needed. I mean, because this startup is good, and it's, uh, it's possibly to be uh, positive in the near future. So my suggestion, it's better to work together with the road transport agency or the regulatory. This is my suggestion. I, this I know, is, this is what I know it's now. hard. It's, it's I know it's yeah, hard, yeah. because I worked in Jordan yeah. for a long time, and I know the situation there. But in order to be beneficial, it's better to present this by any way, not from advocatory point of view, because in Jordan they don't like this way. Unfortunately, we are not very, uh, let's say, open minds uh, to, to listen to any, uh, we can listen to any idea, but in order to adopt the idea, you must have someone strong to support you. You have to start somewhere. We yes. started as, a, as, a, as an advocacy group, volunteer-driven. 
And now some of the work that we're doing, the people in the, who participated in the hackathon, they're building upon it and they're starting their own startups. The government's now on board with us for our next project. So it's, uh, we've proven ourselves in a, in a sense. In the, in so my second question, and, uh, did the government... Their third question. Yeah. Oh, third question. <laughs> did the government adopt this idea or they, are they initially convinced that you are the one that doing good thing for transportation? Or they have different minds, different... Well, they're, uh, they're open uh, to, to what we're doing, but they're, uh, you know, also there's people who, uh, who want to do their own thing and then maybe, you know, it, it, it varies, I guess, by different, different, different people in different organizations. Some people are more open to participating with civil society, with entrepreneurs, others are not. Okay, thank you very much. We Sorry, Paul. Uh, we can take one more quick question. Uh, Hazm, thanks again for sharing your work. Um, I'm curious, you talked about the uh, lack of willingness from the government to share data with you. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious as if those data assets are in real time or not. Some of them are in real time, uh, but most of them are not. That's the, I mean, the short so answer. The, uh, on, on bus routes, uh, most of them are not. They're static data, but one of the bus operators has some real time tracking, but that's not fed into the, that's not owned by the government. So using your platform, have you ever thought about trying to be that intermediary yeah, to yeah. accelerate the transportation reformation in Jordan? Yeah, so that's, in, in the next updates of the, of the, of the app, we're, we're talking about uh, incorporating, you know, read time data where, you know, you could use crowdsourced data to, to determine schedules and uh, when the next bus is gonna arrive, even though we don't have any schedule, but trying to use read time data to, to help people, to make the system more reliable. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Have you talked to the operators like Zane Orange and maybe sponsoring a Wi Fi on the bus that could uh, help yeah, so increase? This is one of the things that we're doing for the, the model bus. We're already talk, we're talking to Zane. Okay. Zane have been you know, had supportive. They hosted the hackathon and they're, they're helping us out with, the, with our next steps. Yep. Very good. I yeah. think that would help increase. Yeah, definitely. We'll take another question, if that's fine by you, Hazem. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you, Hazem, for this um, interesting and great way to tackle a major issue in Jordan. I salute you for that. Um, Jordanian myself, and this has always been a question for me. Uh, transportation um, and, and many other issues, of course. Uh, so about the application, so you said it was launched in two, two 2017? Yeah. About um, a year ago, yeah. Uh -huh. Did you track how successful it was and the number of uh, um, users and how it um, changed or affected their behavior? I think this is something we should have done more work on, I think, and we should have embedded more, uh, you know, analytics into, into the app. We know it's, it's been, you know, uh, downloaded over 10,000 uh, times, uh, and uh, but we, we don't have any quantitative data on how, uh, and this is something that, that we could do, but from, from talking to people, I think we've, we've, you know, we've talked to several people who have really used, uh, used the app and found it very useful, and not, not you know, they have, didn't really like sell their cars and start using the bus, but at least for certain trips where they, they weren't, you know, they didn't even consider using the bus, now they would consider using it, or for trips that where they were already using the bus, they would find a better way to, uh, to make their trips a better route, so, uh, I think this is maybe something that, that we could work on more and try and evaluate how, how the app has done. You know. yeah. uh, my other question, maybe it's irrelevant, yeah. but um, the fast route for the bus that went to uh, yeah. the University Street and whatnot, um, who's dealing with that and how will it come back to life? Uh, it's, so I worked on it about 10 years ago, I could talk to you about it. It's, uh, it's finally coming back to life very slowly. This, for those of you who don't know, it's a bus rapid transit, a BRT line, exclusive bus lanes running in the middle of the, the street, uh, covering around 25 kilometers in Amman. The project uh, construction started in 2010. It was meant to be completed in 2012, 2013, but then the project was suspended for a few years. To make a long story short, it's the construction is now ongoing, and they expect it to begin operating in 2020, 2021. So this, because it's been delayed, I think, so much, 
I think the value in this project is going to be more symbolic and, and really kicking off and showing what it means to have public transport running on exclusive lanes rather than really solving a huge issue. So it only covers a limited set of corridors, and, but I think it will get things going. It has to be successful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hazem, for the great talk and answering the questions. Uh, I can take that. Uh, we'll just wait a few more minutes uh, for our next speaker.